How many of you heard me speaking here before? So just a few of you. So I can kind of like hit some rabbit trails. How many of you have plans afterward? You like you have somewhere to be afterward. Okay, call and cancel those because we might be here for a while. I'm serious. I'm just kidding. Um, yeah, I can see my time. Hey, uh, so tithes and offerings. You guys are at a, a formidable time and just as he was talking about the tithes and offerings, I want to share something with you guys. This is very important. It'll change your life. When you look at the tithe and the offering, especially the tithe, all right, that belongs to God. It's 10% of all your increase. And it's a, it's a tangible substance, right? So if you get money, you have a job, you get a paycheck, it's something that is handed to you. Okay, this isn't... This isn't life and death like you're believing God for faith, like, Lord, heal me or heal a loved one. Uh, this is just something that is provided for us. And God says, hey, I want you to take 10% of that and give that to me. All right? So that 10% that belongs to him, he's saying, put your faith in this. Declare your covenant with me because I declare my covenant with you. This is a way that we honor God. It's a way that we can uh, show that we are in faith and in covenant with him just by simply taking a little chunk of what was given to us, saying, God, I'm gonna give this back to you to further the, the kingdom. So to me, it's faith 101, but if you know anything about tithing, it in Malachi it says, uh, bring all your tithes to the storehouse that there may be meat in my house or food in my house and see that I won't open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that you don't have room to receive. Well, I've tithed for a long time and I'm, I'll be honest with you, I'm waiting for like not enough room to receive in certain areas. But if you read that scripture on further, it says that he will rebuke the devourer for your sake. The devourer is the enemy. And he goes on and he says, I'll rebuke the devourer for your sake so that the, the, the fruit of your ground will not be destroyed. Okay, do you know what ground represents? It represents something that we can plant into and things grow from the ground. So scripture intertwines with scripture. It proves out scripture. I hope I'm not losing you guys here. I'm, let me just wrap this up real quick because this has nothing to do with what I wanted to say tonight. But when you tithe, God says, I'll, I'll open up the windows of heaven and pour out these, th these blessings. He says, prove me on it. Try me on it. This is a, a, a natural substance, but I'm your provider. He says, I'm going to rebuke the devourer for your, for your sake and, and I'm going to protect your ground. What he is saying there is that what you put your hand to, what you sow into, what you give toward, is going to grow up and bear fruit. But if you don't tithe, if you're not giving God his, it's almost as though, Lord, I want to serve you without any of your benefits. It's like getting married and not being able to have sex. Right? Most guys know, you're with me, right? Most guys are like, yeah, I can't wait. I'm going to get married early. Just anybody. No, for real though. <laughs> if you don't have a habit of tithing, I'm telling you, my wife and I have been married. It'll be 13 years in August. We have missed tithing twice early on, I talked myself into somehow God would be okay with it. And it didn't feel right. And we haven't missed since. And I'm telling you, God has always showed up in our lives. Maybe I'll be able to share a story later on, but that's not what I wanted to get to. Become a tither. God says, try me on it. It, it proves that you're in covenant with him. It's taking just a little bit of something natural and saying, yep, I'm in covenant with God. It increases your faith, I'm telling you. Can I get an amen?
All right. Hey, uh, so I, all my heart for tonight, um, my title is What's Love Got to Do? Got to do with it. Who needs a heart when a heart can be broken? Tina Turner, anybody? Actually, for the mature people, I have another title. It's called Take Up the Cross. And um, I want to read this passage, and I don't think I'm going to speak long because, uh, man, uh, I just sense God in this place differently. And I believe that there's going to be some freedom tonight for some people. But I want, to show, I want to show you guys this story, and I want to break it down. A lot of times we read stories, and we don't really, um, we kind of just breeze over them, some of the passages, and we don't really look at what the Lord is saying, so we can miss a bunch of things. Does that make sense to anybody? It does to me. I know I'm a deep thinker, but let's, uh, if you have a Bible, turn to, um, Mark chapter 10. If you don't, you can look on the screen. So bear with me. I'm going to read this passage. And I want you to, to, to gain a little bit from, from this. And then we'll, we'll get moving. I believe that I'm going to speak a little bit of life and, and revival into your life tonight to get you prepared for revival nights. Because revival night... Uh, you can put a draw on the gifts of God. Everybody here is a gift to God and has a gift for God. And there are times when people pull on that gift and you feel like you, you've accomplished something. We're all part of a body. If, if a part of our body isn't working, we feel sick. There's a symptom that comes with it. And so in the last days, Jesus is returning for a perfect bride. The bride of Christ is the body of Christ. That's the church. So if you're a part of a church, how many of y'all part of a church? You have a gift. You have something that you bring to the table. And without you, the body is ailed. And so other gifts are overcompensating for what your position is supposed to be doing. Don't ever give up. Don't ever stop uh, asking, knocking, seeking. Don't ever stop doing that because life moves in seasons. God can can change what you're doing based on your faithfulness to where you're at now, but he can never increase you unless he sees faithfulness. All right, let's get started. Uh, Verse 17. Okay, this is about a rich man. And it says this, as Jesus started walking on his way to Jerusalem, a man came sprinting like Usain Bolt up to him. He knelt down and he asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus says, why do you call me good? Only God is truly good. But to answer your question, you know the commandments. You must not murder. You must not commit adultery. You must not steal. You must not lie. You must not cheat anyone. Honor your father and your mother. Teacher, the man replied, I've obeyed all these commandments since I was young. So he interrupts. He's like, oh, I'm good. I got it, right? Looking at the man, Jesus felt genuine love for him. This is important, that Jesus looked at him and felt genuine love for him because of the statement that he's about to make. He says, there is still one thing that you haven't done. He told him, go and sell all of your possessions and give the money to the poor. And then you'll have treasure in heaven. Then come, and the New King James Version says, take up the cross and follow me. At this, the man's face fell and he went away sad for he had many possessions. Okay, so pause. Guy runs up. What do I got to do to inherit eternal life? Well, you got to follow. You got to follow the commandments. You got to be morally fit. 
This, this guy did not have a, 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 a moral code issue, if you will. He had a faith issue. I'm going to show you what it is. So look at this. Uh, the man left because he had lots of possessions. He didn't want to give up what he had, right? This is so fascinating when I get to the end of the story. Looking, uh, Jesus looked around and he said to his disciples, how hard is it for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God? This amazed them. He's talking to his disciples. But Jesus said again, dear children, it is very hard to enter the kingdom of God. In fact, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were astounded. And they said, then who in the world can be saved? They asked. Okay, so Jesus is talking about rich people entering in the kingdom of heaven. How many Christians, how many in here know somebody that is a, they're a Christian, they love God and they're wealthy? Anybody, right? Okay. Well, this amazed, could you imagine like, they're rich, they're wealthy, they're, they're not, it's hard for them to get to heaven. Like, no, I watched their life. I, I couldn't imagine they're not making it. Like, I don't think they're doing anything wrong. Is it just because they have money that they're not going to make it? No, that's, this is not what Jesus is talking about. He says it's hard for a rich man to enter, but why? Who is he talking about? What kind of a rich person is he talking about? He says, uh, the disciples were astounded. He said, they say, who in the world can be saved? My wife turned me on to this statement because she listened to a teaching and I thought it was fascinating and I thought it was true. She, she said that somebody that she was listening to pointed out in this scripture, think about that. Why would they ask that question? Who can be saved then if they didn't have money? It's God's will for us to have provision, all right? It's, it's not God's will for us to just be getting by. It's God's will for us to have enough supply. And if you look in the Old Testament, every time he rescued the children of Israel, his chosen people, when they were enslaved, every time that they got their hearts right and he moved them out of a place of enslavement, they were rich. Every single time. You won't find a spot where he did not give them more than enough. We can see the characteristic of who God is and how he treats his children, but there's a man's side to receiving that. That's what I want to talk to you guys a little bit about tonight. Uh, so they asked, who can be saved? Jesus looked at them intently, so he was intense. He wasn't just like, he was like this. <laughs> he looked at him intently. He said, Humanly speaking, this is mission impossible. I added the mission. This is, this is impossible. But with God, everything is possible. Pause again. Humanly speaking, it's impossible for a rich man to go to heaven. But with God, everybody say with God. All things are possible. Which man can get to heaven? Which rich man can get to heaven? The one without God or the one with God? Can you see that? You'll see it here in a second if you didn't then. Peter began to speak up. It's like, all right, Peter, I'm trying to teach you guys a lesson. You got to say something again. Go ahead. Jesus has to be patient. He says, well, we've given up everything to follow you. He says... Yes, and I assure you that everyone who has given up house or brothers or sisters or mother or father, children, property, for my sake and for the good news, for the gospel, will receive now, in return, a hundred times as many houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and property, along with persecution, and in the world to come. and that person will have eternal life. Okay, did you see what I just said? Do you, you see what the word just said there? 
there's so many little things in this passage. Number one, the man, he had a faith issue. His faith was in his possessions. What do I have to do to uh, inherit eternal life? Good teacher. Whoa, I'm not good. God's good. But I will tell you, you gotta obey the commandments. Well, I do all that. I'm good. Well, 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 now wait a minute. I want you to give up the world and come follow me. His faith was in his possessions. He walked away sad. He was rich. He was young. He didn't want to give up the world. Here's what's crazy. His disciples asked him, who can make it? He said, well, if you go and do the human thing, it's impossible. But with God, you can be rich and go to heaven. So what would he actually have lost? Nothing. He wouldn't have lost anything. Listen to what it says here. Jesus said, if you give up, now he's not even talking about possessions. He's talking about loved ones, people. Anybody have a family member that persecutes you for your walk with Christ? Right? It's terrible. I, I'm, I'm working with somebody right now that they are in such a, a demoralized place because of family. And I, I said, okay, well, what are you going to choose? Are you going to function through life hanging on to siblings and your parents and get into this low depressive state, not doing anything for God because of them? Or are you going to give them up for the sake of the gospel? See, I would never tell anybody that unless it was in the scripture. I was fully confident to, to tell this person, hey, you should probably just let them know I'm not coming around. And I said, and watch, when they start to get into trouble or they need something, they come against something that's real in life, guess who they're gonna call? They're gonna call you. When, when you have a, uh, a passion, you, you have something, a, a conviction that, that you live by. The world is going to uh, make you defend it. Tell me what, prove that. Tell me why you believe that. The world will tell you, why is that right? When you have a conviction that's truth, it defends itself. It's like math. Uh, if, I, if we all were sitting in math class right now and the teacher said one plus one is two, uh, it's truth. You, you can't argue that the conviction would be, hey, one plus one is two. If you have one and add another one, you're gonna have two. Well, tell me why that's true. Well, can you see? Here's one. Here's another one. That makes two. The truth defends itself. Well, the reason why I said that is because the scripture is truth. So if I present the scripture, I don't have to defend anything that I say the truth will defend itself. There was a, uh, a friend, I guess, an acquaintance that got a hold of me and um, was bringing a friend to church. And it was on a first Wednesday, I believe it was April. It was like, yeah, two months, two months ago or a little bit more than two months ago. And uh, they said, hey, uh, is there going to be any, you know, Anybody there afterwards that can pray for my friend? Uh, she's got news that her, her mother is sick and um, bad report. 
doesn't believe in God and um, she just needs prayer. And I'm like, well, I'm going to be there tonight. You, she'd come, I'll, I'll pray with her. But I said, does she want prayer for her, her for herself or does she want prayer for, for her mom? Is her mom going to be there? Or? Well, no, she wants, she wants prayer for her mom but her mom's not going to be there. Okay. So they, they came down after service and um, I was just talking with her friend and the, the person that got a hold of me was there to support um, their friend. They work, they're coworkers. And uh, she was really upset about everything that was going on. And um, so I, I just started to tell her a few things about scripture and about God's mercy and his goodness and uh, started to pray for her for peace because she's in agony you know about her mother's condition and um, as I'm praying for her you know the presence of God anybody feel the presence while we were worshiping I sure did it's thick right you can you can just feel it it's like God is just like embracing you right the anointing is much like that and the more that you step out in faith to pray for people, the more the anointing, his presence, that power shows up. Well, that power showed up as I was speaking and, and, and praying for her. Scripture says that the anointing can go into cloth. All right, so that's a Bible fact. Paul laid his hands on aprons and cloths and sent them out, handkerchiefs, sent them out. And when they touched people that were sick, they were healed. People that were possessed with devils, the devils left. Radical stuff, right? So this just, hey, the anointing's present. I'm gonna, I'm gonna grab a cloth, I'll grab a prayer cloth. And I said, here, you put your hands on this with me because this, this had nothing to do with me. This is the word, the anointing's here. We're gonna pray scripture. We're gonna pray his word into this cloth. And the anointing, the healing anointing will touch your mom. So we prayed. I said, when you go home, you just give this cloth to your mom. I don't even know why I say some of the stuff that I say are, but this is what I said. I said, you just give that to your mom and you say, here you go, this is the mercy of God. And I said, you don't have to say anything else. Now, I don't know if she said it like that or what she did. <laughs> and I, I followed up like a week later with the friend. I said, hey, how, how's your friend doing? How's your mom? And I'm, I'm waiting, you know, to hear this great testimony. And she, she's doing all right. I'm like, wow, oh, man, did I flake out? You know, because when you do stuff for God it, that that takes faith and it's according to, to the word, we always want to see instant manifestations. Always. I mean, there's, there's a reason why we, mankind made microwaves. There's a reason why we have drive throughs We want instant manifestation of food or coffee right now. It's the same thing with doing things for God. God, I want to, I want to step into my place of ministry. I want to do it right now. And then you go try stuff and you look crazy. It's a growth process. Okay, so <clears throat> to, I, I, I sort of forgot about it, to be honest with you. And I get a text message. Hey, by the way, uh, so-and-so's mom, she's doing better. In fact, so-and-so was in the middle of the showroom crying, and all of a sudden she says, the cloth worked. <laughs> I was like, wait a minute, the cloth worked. Well, what happened? And she, she healed? She received Jesus? Like what? She's like, I don't know the complete details yet, but I know that she said, the cloth worked. She's in church. She was not a believer. She's getting better, she's doing better, and she's treating her husband a lot nicer. 
<clears throat> I'm afraid that we are uh, we're, we're, we're living in a time where we're teetering between what we can accomplish naturally for God through hard work and programs um, and perhaps missing out on the supernatural, which the supernatural takes faith. The Bible says that if you do a work without faith, it's in vain because God only works through faith. In fact, Hebrews eleven six says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. So if you're doing something to please God, but you're not using faith, he don't like it. It's in vain. And, and listen, I'm not getting down on hard work and programs because listen, the, here's a great illustration. The ark, Noah, that was like 100 years. That was hard work. And the program only had eight people enlisted into it because eight were saved. The rest of the world, it looked foolish. They weren't competing with the Titanic. They weren't like, we're going to make a ship that won't sink better than the Titanic. It had never rained before. And it took them a hundred years. This was God's mercy on the, on the people that were unrighteous. This was also God's mercy on Noah and his family. See, God, God does not wipe people out because they're bad people in the Old Testament. God was wiping people out because he was wiping out the sin. He could not afford for that nature to get into the righteous beings. And eventually, it would have. The Bible says a little bit of leaven leavens the whole loaf. Who we hang around is important. Uh, so looking at the story of Noah, the hard work, the program, I, I'm not talking about that. But if you, if you look at the story with the hard work, the program of doing the ship, the ark, it took faith to build that. Why? Because it had never rained before. He had to listen to God. He had to start preparing this boat. He had to take the persecution. What are you doing? You're an idiot. This guy's been building a boat for 50 years. Let's, yeah, okay, this isn't going to work. You see, he wasn't conformed to the patterns and the ways of, uh, of the world. Now, let's look at this young, rich ruler in, in, in uh, Mark chapter 10. The conformity there was, I have faith in what I've worked for. This is how the world works. You work hard. You run over people. You get rich. You get the things that you need. And I'm a good guy. I'm, I'm following moral code. I should make it. Scripture is proving that it's more than moral code. It's faith. Why do we do the things that we do? Are we willing to turn our backs on the world? Okay, this is the great exchange. My life for yours. Jesus' life for, for ours. What does that look like? Some people say uh, fear is the opposite of faith. You know, if you're not in faith, you're in fear. And Well, those people were not in faith, but they weren't in fear either. Because if they were in fear, a couple of them would have been climbing up on that boat or at least trying to buy a ticket. But they weren't afraid. You know what I believe the opposite of, of faith is? Is conformity. Romans chapter 12 says this, verse two. I put the amplified up there, I think. And do not be conformed to this world any longer with its superficial values and customs 
but be transformed. Everybody say transformed. And progressively changed as you mature spiritually by the renewing of your mind, focusing on godly values, ethical attitudes, so that you may prove for yourselves what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect in his plan and purpose for you. Everybody say, I have a plan and I have a purpose from God. Conformity, faith. Uh, pressures from this world. Everybody, okay, so I'm, I can get passionate about some of these things, but when I read scripture, I'm like, hmm, why would we do that? So some things that I say at times, you know, if take it with a grain of salt at sometimes, unless you get, you're like, yeah, that's right for me too. Because what might be right for me might have to do with my place in the body. What might be right for you may have to do with your place in the body, but it should never be conformity to the world. So let me explain that. Let's say that, uh, let's say that you know how to make money. The Bible says that if you have the gift of giving, give liberally, right? So if, if, if you have the gift of giving, well, you gotta have stuff in order to give stuff. And if God says that it's a gift to be able to give, I want you to give a lot. I believe there's a lot, of, I, well, no, I shouldn't say a lot, but I believe that there's men and women in here that part of your call and placement in the body of Christ is that you have the gift of giving. You may say, well, I got 50 bucks in my account right now. Well, what would a lot of that be for you? I don't know. I don't know what your budget is. But God doesn't start off giving or using people to give the millions before he starts off giving the tens. You know, there's some people in here that uh, you have a teaching gift. If you have the gift of teaching, teach well, study. We doesn't start off teachers at Madison Square Garden like Billy Graham giving the message. Starts off with the one and the small groups, perhaps something like this. And, but what are you doing to go after the will of God? Perhaps the young rich ruler, as the Bible describes him, perhaps he had the gift of giving. But see, all he could see was the getting for himself. Therefore, he missed out on being a part of the body of Christ. Because his focus wasn't on, I've obtained these things to glorify God. I've obtained these things for this, the, the, the status that I will carry in, in my city. There's a, there's a huge difference. You see, if he, if he would have given all that stuff up, what would he have lost? Nothing. He would have gained it all back a hundredfold. Here, here, here's the final point. In this age and in the one to come, eternity. So I have trouble when people say that, well, that's for when we die. You know, God's provision and his goodness and his, his healing and his provision for us to not have financial problems and all of that is for heaven. Well, that's not what Jesus is saying here. Do you see that? So revival nights are coming up. What does revival look like? What is revival? 
revival is a group of people that stop conforming. They unite. We're called the united in here. Like-minded. They get on the same page and they say, we don't care what we are exposed to. We must expose the word of God. If we want to see revival happen, you have to give up everything. If you want the anointing working in your life, you have to, you have to turn your back on the world. The Bible says that those that are in Christ, they're ambassadors. Do you know what an ambassador is? An ambassador is one that represents someone else. So we have embassies, U.S. embassies, that represent, there's an ambassador, he's kind of like the governor uh, of the U.S. in another country. Could be in a very hostile environment. But if you go to that embassy and you walk in, you would feel like you were in the U.S. Everything in that embassy represents your culture, your nation, where you're from, so that you, you don't forget who you are. Well, if we're ambassadors in Christ here on earth, the Bible says that we are seated in heavenly places with him as he is in this world, so are we. So to function and to operate like Christ, what does that take? What does it cost? Everything. Okay, so I have to wrap this up. Um, I'm, I, I'm going to show you in John chapter 15. You should really write this down. This will change your life. Um, Jesus, this whole chapter, he's talking about staying connected to him. And he's, he's using a tree and vines. Daniel, do you want to come up? The band, perhaps? Um, he, he's using uh, an illustration of uh, a, a vine and fruit being connected to the tree and that if it's not connected, it, it withers and dies. But in, 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 in John 15, 7, he says this. He says, if you get your life from me, Okay, how many have received salvation? How many have, have asked Jesus to come in your heart? How many have confessed him? That he's the son of God. He went to the grave for you. He was raised from the dead. All right. So if, if he says, if you get your life from me. Okay, well, if you've made that confession and, and you've believed that in your heart, the Bible says that you're a new creation. You have life in, in Christ. But then he goes and he says, and my words live in you. Ask whatever you want and it will be done for you. How many of you have been asking, be, just be honest. Listen, I've, I've asked for several things over the years and haven't seen squat. I've also asked for things over the years and I've seen a lot. But how many of you in here have been asking God for certain things? And you're not seeing anything. And it's frustrating. Right? We all go through it. It would do all of us a really, really good deal to find scripture that has to do with your request. See, we don't, we don't, we don't necessarily know how to pray or communicate with God because God is sovereign to his word. In 2 Timothy, it says, when you're faithless, I am faithful to my word. I cannot deny myself. So the begging, the pleading, the crying, oh Lord, help me. He's not moved. Yes, he has, he has mercy. If you're brand new in Christ, yeah, you're probably gonna get what you're asking for. 
But then you're gonna get frustrated because that doesn't work forever. It's like teaching my children that are uh, teaching my children how to tie their shoes. Eventually, I had to stop tying their shoe. It would have been easier because you get in a hurry to tie the shoe. But eventually, say, no, you tie it. Come on, Dad, just tie it. Tie my shoe just real quick. It'll be, it'll be quick. Yeah, I know. And we have to leave. We don't have time. Tie your shoe. And it's not tight. It probably comes undone. But eventually, you have to pull back as a parent and let them do, right? Here's a key phrase. If my word lives in you. This is the word. In Isaiah uh, chapter 43 and 25, 26, basically what the Lord is saying there is remind me of my promises. Let's talk together. Build your case. Tell me why you're, you're not guilty. Well, if you've received Jesus into your heart and your heritage is through by the blood of Jesus Christ, you are not guilty. You may have some stuff going on, but in 1 John 1, 9, it says that if you have some sin going on in your life, whoever goes to God and confesses his sin, he forgets it. He forgives and forgets it. Here's an amazing part of that scripture. It goes on and says, he'll forgive you and he'll cleanse you from all unrighteousness. A lot of us dig up the dead man. Carry him around. This is who I am. Somebody says something about who we used to be. We pick it up. Yeah, that's me. And we care. Why? That's not, that's not what God said about you. Again, you're, you're, you're looking back at the world instead of him. When the word starts to be cultivated in your heart, ask him anything and he'll do it. So I'm going to tell on myself and tell you a great testimony. Um, this was back a while, weeks ago, around Mother's Day. And um, my wife and I have, we know that we're in this season where we're, we're believing God for everything. And for extra financial provision we were praying for extra. Long story short, uh, I paid some extra stuff on some bills and we were going to run out as far as our goals were concerned with finances. So I had $20 and like 44 miles left in my car. You know, you can hit the button and tell you how much you have left. And uh, my wife, she didn't say anything after the fact she said she knew but she just said she stayed in faith and so Friday morning I said something to the Lord Lord we need some money and then Saturday I prayed and this is how I prayed I said Lord according to your word which you cannot deny yourself from answering you, you said to remind you of your promises you said in, in, in the book of Numbers that you're not a man that you should lie. And Jeremiah 1.12, you said that you hasten to your word to perform it. I said, Lord, you said that the righteous you would never forsake and they would never have to beg for bread. How would this bring you glory if I have to ask somebody to borrow money? Lord, we need money. I'm asking you according to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Whole day goes by, I come to work, have a few appointments, I'm leaving work and I'm supposed to pick up some, some gifts. And I drive away, I've got this money and I'm like, I need more money. And so this is how merciful and good God is. I start to have the thought, I'm gonna buy a lottery ticket right now. And just see if I can get some money. Like, so I'm thinking naturally, 
probably 120 seconds away from doing this. My phone rings. It's my dad. He works here at the church. He says, hey, did you leave? I said, yeah, I left. He said, well, hey, so-and-so came up and gave me an envelope for you and Courtney. It's just, they said it was full of money. You want to come back and get it? I said, yep. <laughs> Here's what's amazing. There's no coincidences with God. This person told my father, God had dealt with them. God's always on time. God had dealt with them previously about this and they didn't listen. But then they heard it again today. And they said, I, I, I could not not be in obedience any longer. I just please give it to him. I wanted to give it to him together, but I couldn't find them both. Can you just give this to them? He said, yeah, I'll, I'll give it to him. I know that this person hears from God. So I take the envelope. I said, Dad, I got to have a moment with God because this, this is huge, right? I mean, 50 bucks would have been good. 100 bucks would have been over the top. I opened up the envelope. It was 10 $100 bills. Over the top. There's no doubt in my mind. None that God is sovereign to his word. What are you asking for? How are you asking? Is the word living in you? There's a difference between having your salvation and, and your life is in him. But then when you add the fact that his words are living in you, that changes your behavior. You no longer have to look to see what the world's doing and conform. Well, I've got to do this. I've got to put my money here. I've got to, this. no, there is no guarantee with conformity of the world. But you know who's 100%? God. God is Father. He's 